You don't have gum, is what you say. people have not looked at their grades or feedback yet. Is there anyone who does not know how to do that? Um, 
asking me for the best policy. Can somebody tell me how you do it? Because I don't know how to do it either. Go to where you submitted it and basically your grade is just okay. There you go. Perfect. Um, so if you do need to look at your grade and um, your assignment feedback, you can do so there. As an aside, you do have to look at your grade and assignment feedback. Can anyone tell me why it is an absolute necessity that you do that? To improve your work? Uh, is it going to help? It will, but that's not the reason. These are all fantastic suggestions. They aren't the reason why. Has anyone looked at the brief for assignment four? So no. you have to write about it. You do. In assignment four, you have to write about your feedback for assignment two. So if you haven't read the feedback for assignment two, you can't do part of assignment four. If you can't do that part of assignment four, So yeah, yeah, you have to do it. So you have to look at your feedback, copy it, paste it, and then tell me how you are going to act upon it in assignment four. Or you do not pass go. You do not collect two hundred pounds. You go straight to jail. To use a monopoly analogy. Are we all clear? Superb. If you have any questions about feedback, I will answer them for you. I will talk about it and I will explain and now I will be happy to know about it. But a lot of people did really well, so. Um, and you should have all got something constructive about what you're doing and what you're going forward. Right. Point two before we begin today is this. I have been asked by Angelia and uh, Nikki to pass on this message. The Media Society has been resurrected. Um, it was dead, and now it is no longer dead. It has a life, it is breathing again. So, they have an Instagram account, um, Swansea Uni Media Sock. It's not sophisticated. I think it could be improved. But what are you going to do? Um, they're having a social next week. I think they were planning on the 6th, which is Wednesday. And I think the plan is for that to be in room 104, Digital Technium building, but I don't know the time. Uh, it will be sometime around 4 o'clock, I'm guessing. Where I don't know what they're doing either, because they don't tell. I'm not a student. Why, why should I know? I don't care. I'm not a student. I don't care. Um, Please check their Instagram account. They're going to put something up by the end of play tomorrow about what the details of that are. Um, and they will be doing lots of cool stuff in the new year, um, in particular around virtual reality and gaming, because finally my lab will be back in January and I will be able to use it. And all you nice people will be able to use it too. Okay. It's really quiet in here. Okay, before we begin. What's wrong with you people? Why are they, have you got problems? What's the problem here? Hmm? Hangover? That's fucking weak. <laughs> <laughs> You're like an 18, 19, 20 year old. How can you be hungover? When I was your age, I used to drink like 10 pints a night. And like 8 in the day. See, that is just piss. What else is going on? Is everyone at the point now where they're like, oh please just end? This has been going on way too long in this book. I've been here for like nine weeks. What the hell is going on? Okay. Well, fortunately today, this is kind of drawing things to an end. We're definitely in the last part of this module. You should all now be working on assignment three, which is due in a week today. Two o'clock next Thursday, is that right? The eighth? Okay. So should all be working away on that. And I've seen about 10 drafts so far. I don't think anyone has given me anything which was anything less than like 70% so far. You know, everything is pretty good. But it's a really straightforward sort of 
sign that I help. Designed to help you specifically with assignment four and how to lead into something on assignment four, basically. I know you're doing a different topic because I've just arbitrarily given you topics to cover, but that's the whole purpose of it. Assignment four approaches like some kind of mystical sea creature. It's January, the doing that January the 12th. It's a different year. It seems so far away. It is six weeks away. And for at least two of those weeks, you will have zero focus on anything to do with university. Because as soon as you get out of this dump, you'll be like, I am not thinking about that dump ever again. And then you will have to think about it. And then when you do start thinking about it, it'll be like January the 5th. You go, damn, I've got to do feedback reflection, a plan, a 2,000 word essay, and a bibliography by the 12th. And I've got seven days to do it in. And then you go, oh, shit, no, my life is going to end. Things are going to get bad. People will starve. Millions will die. You want to avoid those conclusions. So, today, I am going to take some time to go over each essay question, to give you a plan exactly how I want it answered. I am the marker. So to do what I tell you to do is only going to benefit you. Picture me in January. It's dark. It's cold. The thrill of Christmas is gone. There's nothing worth living for. The World Cup is over. I'm back to watching Swansea City every week. My depression levels can get no lower. Nobody's drinking because everyone goes, oh yeah, I'm gonna have a dry January. Fuck you all. <laughs> so even going to the pub is no fun because there's no one in there. Then I have a hundred essays come in, which have to be marked in three weeks. Hundred essays times two thousand words each. Who wants to do the maths? Not even a difficult so Who can tell me how many words I have to go through? Really? Do any, have any of you got a GCSE in mathematics? Very, very good, Emma. 200,000 words. 200,000. One fifth of a million. Which I have to read and mark and give feedback and pretend to care. But I don't. It's very difficult with that stage. So, do what I tell you, and that makes my life easier in January. Make my life easier in January, I'm more disposed to giving good marks. As an aside, you've all been in education for at least 15 years, right? Minimum. Use yes or no question. Is marking objective? Lauren, you can go on like this. Yes. Marking is objective. No. 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 <laughs> marking is one of the least objective exercises ever. Nobody <laughs> marks objectively. When lecturers tell you to do things with regards to your assignments, do them. It doesn't matter what they say. Do what they tell you to do. Do not think, I will not do that. When lecturers tell you to do it in 12-point font, do not hand in an assignment that is in 18-point font and therefore looks like it was written by a primary school child. Do not hand it in in red. Fuck you and your red. I don't care. Things everyone is still doing, which absolutely great my gears. One, if you don't know how to use a semicolon, don't use them. Two, the only thing that should ever be in italics is the title of a book, film, or television program. Nothing else. Three, books, titles, of films, titles of television programmes are not quotes. 
Therefore, what should they not be in? Quotation marks, yeah. Quotation marks, there's a clue in the title. Quotation marks are for quotes, not for the titles of things. If somebody puts the title of something in a quotation mark again, I will look in January, I will look up your home address, and I will come and shit through your mail. <coughs> I promise you. Four. There is no such thing as bullet points when you write in an academic piece of work. There is no place for bullet points. Bullet points are not appropriate, especially in a bibliography. How should a bibliography be ordered? Alphabetical, alphabetical order. Not by <coughs> bullet points in alphabetical order. I hate bullet points. Bullet points are fascist. I don't like fascists. I am anti-fascist. Interesting on the topic. No more bullet points. I never want to see a bullet point again from any of you. If I do, I'm going to, again, visit your house, but I'm not going to do the first thing. Instead, I'm going to kill your hamster by eating it. Oh, this one's like uh, Is there anything else I need to tell you not to do? Um, this also goes for next week, by the way. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you're citing something in your writing, do I need to know in the citation itself the name, the first name of the person being cited? No. Do I need to know their initials? No. Where can I find that out? No. In the bibliography. So don't put it there. Please don't put it there. It angers me so much. No. I'm on my third laptop this semester, just by punching the screen. Okay. Now, what I have just done. <coughs> is given you a discourse. I have given you a discursive argument about how things should be laid out when you are giving something for an assessment. I have proposed a set of rules which you are to follow me and given you a conclusive argument, not a really conclusive, the argument basically by the time don't piss me off, right? But there is an argumentative sense here that if you were to step outside this discursive formation, you will be punished in some way. Therefore, I have engaged in a discourse with you around assessment. Discourse is incredibly important in media, and I am taking the time to have, if you like, an extra short session on it today for one particular reason. I've been running, it's actually my fifth anniversary today of being back at Swansea University. So I did my PhD here, but then I went and worked in a variety of different places. And now I've been back five years. In those five years I've been running this module. And indeed, it sounds weird, but like I took over this module on December the 1st, 2017, when it was like a week left. And then did all the marking, because the people in charge of it didn't want to do it anymore. At least 50% of the essays that come in on this module every year are something which is concerned with discourse. So I've decided this year more than any other year that I will focus a little bit more on discourse as an idea because it will obviously help those who are deciding to go forward with it. And primarily people tend to look at about 30% of the answers are always about Hollywood cinema and the discourse is inherent in Hollywood cinema. A lot of the time there are really good answers on this. And I'm not suggesting that people do this badly particularly. But also, there is a tendency for people not to get the details clear on what discourse is as a thing, how it operates through those mediums. So today I just want to take a little bit of extra time to contextualise discourse as an idea more clearly. I'm going to ground it in something which isn't Hollywood cinema, but which you can use nevertheless in order to think about how Hollywood cinema operates in terms of a discursive function. So, discourse, this is the classic definition of what discourse is. When statements about a topic are made with a particular discourse, the discourse itself makes it possible to construct the topic in a certain way. It also limits the other ways in which the topic can be constructed. Now, 
About six, seven weeks ago on this module, I used the example of immigration as a form of discourse which operates in this way. Discussions about immigration in the United Kingdom are largely led by a certain area of the media in the UK, that is print media, in particular newspapers like the Daily Mail, Daily Express. And they talk about immigration in a particular way, which makes it therefore very difficult to talk about it in other ways. Because it becomes an overwhelming consensus that immigration is a problem in a particular way. Now, a few weeks ago, I used the idea of there being an invasion, which has become a discourse created by the media to describe people arriving in the United Kingdom via small boats from France. This is now classified in the media as an invasion of people. That we are being invaded. And to get even more specific about that, we are being invaded by the people from the country of Albania. And they get even more specific than that. We are being invaded by Albanian criminal gangs. So the discourse has become really specific. So now, it's very difficult to talk about these events without that discourse being implied over the top of what is actually happening. It's limiting the way that we can actually discuss this topic. Because as soon as you bring it up, people say, yeah, they're all Albanian criminals. It's like, but they're not. Like, no, they are, I read in the paper. No, that's not, just because you read it in a paper doesn't make it true, I'm afraid. Newspapers don't tell the truth, they construct a version of the truth in order to give an ideological position, which is a discourse. That's what a discourse is. So, discourse works to construct how we can talk about something. That is what a discourse is. When things are done discursively, there is an effort going on to frame how we can talk about a particular thing and to keep it within that frame. And that frame is always ideological. It is framed by a particular ideology. Now, the university is masterful at discourses. Absolutely masterful. The university will always address you in emails from like nobody, because there's not even a person behind this, some ridiculous apartment, as if they are your friend. They will always, you know, it will be nice and warm and welcoming, because the university has a discursive thing going on here. All communication with students is human, and we are kind, and approachable, and sweet, and loving people. None of that is true. This university, if you were on fire, they would charge you for the fire extinguisher to put you out. And that is how universities work. They are a business. You're getting to know this, right? You are asking yourself, why is Greg's charging more there than it does in town? Who can tell me the answer? It's convenient. Yes, for you, yeah. What is it convenient for? They know that the students <coughs> would rather go downstairs and get in the bus so that they they know they can charge more because... And therefore you can charge students more. You can rip students off because they haven't got any other choice, right? Welcome to capitalism. That's how it works. Yes, the university has decreed that the Greggs downstairs, a franchise of the Greggs organisation, can rip you off. And the university wants you them to do this because it top slices what they actually take in as well. So that little bit extra is going straight into the university. So never mind the 9,000 quid. They're getting more. They're getting more and more for you all the time. Anyway, I am cognizant that this is being recorded and this is my employer I'm talking about. But, um, <laughs> the university constructs ways in which we can talk about them. Or at least they are attempting to do that. On the counterbalance of that, you have lecturers like me who tell you this is bullshit. <laughs> 
and you should not listen to any of it. So it kind of undermines its own argument by employing people like me a little bit. But nevertheless, there is an attempt being made to do this. Can anyone else in this room think of a, another form of discourse which they have encountered recently? There's a whole thing going on in the Middle East at the moment, which some people are taking interest in. Very interesting discourses going on. Well, oh God, I'm so depressed. Okay, let me ask you this question. Why would the authorities in Qatar not allow Welsh football fans to wear rainbow coloured hats to matches before Wales were eliminated from the tournament? Um, it's because um, homosexuality is illegal in um, Qatar. It is legally not allowed to practice homosexuality in Qatar. Okay. What's that got to do with rainbow hats? Well, they, uh, they are uh, representative of the pride flag. They're a symbol. A symbolic gesture of allegiance or support for the LGBTQIA plus community. If you wear a rainbow hat, or like me, when I go to Swan, sometimes I wear a rainbow scarf, you are either identifying with or identifying your support for this community. So, in Qatar, where homosexuality is deemed to be immoral and is therefore being made illegal to practice, they are stopping the possibility of this discussion occurring. They are stopping it by identifying that there are particular symbolic forms, i.e. these rainbow bucket hats, which present a message about the visibility of being part of the LGBTQIA plus community, or indeed practicing homosexuality itself, and say, no, that cannot be made visible in this society because they have a particular discourse about homosexuality in Qatar, which is inscribed in law. A lot of people have asked, like, how, can they make a, how can they make homosexuality illegal? That doesn't make any sense. Like, well, that only doesn't make sense if you're ignorant of history. You know, it's like the Holocaust was legal. The law said that that could happen. You can make laws for anything. In Qatar, they have made a set of laws and therefore constructed discourses around those laws to justify them, to legitimise the prejudice inscribed in those laws. Any kind of discursive statement like wearing a rainbow hat is a challenge to that and therefore must be shut down. You cannot speak about this stuff. You cannot speak about it in a positive manner. It doesn't exist. Therefore, you get rid of the hat, get rid of the problem. This is a very naive way of looking at it. This is an extremely poorly run World Cup in terms of its PR. And rightly so, I think a lot of people around the world are starting to believe you know, we can turn off from this because this is ridiculous. But this is an example of how a discourse is created. In this case, not a particularly good discourse. So, any questions on discourse so far? Seem fairly clear? Very good. And we passed. This course is a series of statements. Statement here must be taken in context though. When I say statement, what I mean is beyond something just said. A statement can be wearing a rainbow bucket hat to a football match. You are making a statement. However, as we classically think of it in academia, it is a way of organising knowledge in order to make something appear to be true. So discourses are organised in particular ways so it makes itself evident that what you are talking about is correct, even if it isn't. So the discourse around this invasion which is happening at the moment, apparently, on the south coast of England, that is constructed in a way in which there is no way that it could be false. 
that this could be claimed to be untrue. Every day, there's a hundred or so people arriving. This is an invasion. It's not really. An invasion is like you know, tanks and armies rolling into a country like the Ukraine. That's an invasion. That's actually what an invasion is. This course contains not just statements, but encoded in those statements a set of beliefs about a particular situation. So, if the media is telling us that there is an invasion on the south coast at the moment, what beliefs are encoded in that? The basic statement is, we are being invaded by criminal gangs from the country of Albania. What beliefs are encoded into that? Well, let's start with the basics. Is this a good or a bad thing? Bad thing. <coughs> Nobody ever said an invasion was a good thing. You know, I, my house has been invaded by termites, but I'm overjoyed because invasions are wonderful. Invasion is a bad word. Invasion is a pejorative term. It is an aggressive term. It states that something is happening against the will of those who are being invaded. So invasion itself proposes that this is a bad thing. So we have a belief that this is not good. What else is being said? What do we know about the country of Albania? Does anyone know anything about the country of Albania? No, me neither, really. I'll be honest with you. The only thing I know about Albania, really, is prior to um, communism taking hold in the late 1940s, they used to settle disputes by the blood food, which I think is awesome and we should bring back. So, Tobias, you kill my brother. Okay? If I had a brother, I'd suspect he'd be a bit of a prick. So, I'd be okay. I'd kind of be okay with that, right? But, in the blood field, I've got to avenge him. But I'm not going to avenge him by killing you. This is a blood food, right? So I'm going to find your brother and kill him instead. Right? But then, like, his wife, who's got a brother, she's like, oh, yeah, like this twat, I know. So, that guy comes on and kills one of mine. And on and on it goes. Awesome. This is how all disputes should be settled until you have no family left. And then, like, the one who's got, like, one person left, they're the winner. That's, a, that's amazing. That, I mean, this is way better than anything. Like, they should actually make this a thing on I'm a Celebrity. I, I would watch that programme if that happened. Or Love Island. The blood food on Love Island. That would be epic. I would so be watching Okay. I digress. I know nothing about that. Maybe <laughs> apart from that, right? But... Now I know quite a bit about Albania because I'm told that all these people from Albania who are coming here are criminals. I'm like, ooh, 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 I like criminals. What kind of criminals are they? Oh yeah, drugs, you know, racketeering. Does anyone know what racketeering is? What? Not quite. More like pr protection brackets and things like that. Um, you know, you like you know, old school mafia shit. Uh, so you've got drugs and you've got this. People <laughs> trafficking, that's what they do, that's a big thing, right? And all this good stuff. I, like, I didn't know anything about that thing here before. Like, Holy shit. Sounds like a place I don't want to go on holiday anymore. All the people there are criminals who do this. So you fill in the gaps in people's knowledge. Does anyone actually think all Albanians are like that? <coughs> I don't even know an Albanian, but I'm fairly sure that they're not going to be drug dealers. Because most people aren't. Because drug dealers is a really bad idea. And you have a life expectancy of about 28 if you're a drug dealer. So, you know, unlikely. So, what have I got? My discourse here statements. And then it's encoded a set of beliefs. In a certain group of people, i.e. those who consume that media, 
who consume those arguments, who don't challenge those arguments, because they're continually reinforced over and over again. And very often, people who are looking for a scapegoat in some way, you know, life is shit at the moment. Prices are going up, wages are going down, we're spending all our money on heat in our homes instead of, you know, coke and hookers, which is what we want to spend our money on. It's not fun at the moment. Life blows. Who are we to hold responsible for life blowing? Are these fucking people? Why not? Makes sense to me. These people coming over here, invading the country, taking and doesn't seem like they're taking anyone's jobs. If they if they were good drug dealers, they wouldn't need to take anyone's jobs. You know, but um, maybe we're concerned about the livelihood of drug dealers in the United Kingdom. You know, look after your own. Um, you know, we can scapegoat these people. They serve an ideological function. And the ideological function is this: whenever you see anything like this happen in the <coughs> Always ask yourself, what are you not being asked to look at? Over there is all <coughs> the people coming here on small boats. Yeah? And everyone's pointing at them and saying, look, this is terrible, this is happening, this is an invasion. And over here, the country is <coughs> burning to the ground. But you're being asked to look over there. You're being asked to ignore that, you know, if you slip and fall in your house and break your leg, you're going to have to lie on the floor for 12 hours for an ambulance. You're being asked to ignore that, you know, the old people on the street, you know, it's cold, it's winter, they're going to freeze to death this winter because they can't afford to have a heating on. They're going to be asked to ignore that the family down the other end of the street who've got kids in school are sending them to school hungry because they can't afford to feed them before going to school. All of that stuff's going on, but whoa, that's the big thing over there. The discourse is created here to create a certain set of beliefs in order, in this particular case, to make you look away from the big problems that happen. Can discourse be created by those who consume the media? I people. Yeah. So it isn't just the way a discourse works it is exactly like this. It may well be created in the media, however, <coughs> it is continually recycled amongst those who have consumed that media and have discussed it with others. So it's, a, it's what we call a recursive function. The recursive function is something I'll talk about later actually, but the recursive function means you continually go back to something over and over again. Everything recycles around to it all the time. This is how discourses take root, if you like, because we're always pushed back to this. So you read something and then you talk with somebody and it's the same thing. And then you go back and see the television and it's the same thing and you're continually trapped in this loop where you are always receiving the same information. That means that a discourse, if you like, can be maintained and reinforced always outside of the media. And indeed, it does mean that a discourse can emerge from outside the media, be picked up by, cycled that way as well, which does also happen. So, yeah, it's, it is not something exclusively media in any way, shape, or form. Okay, we're all good. <coughs> good. Okay. When you have a successful discourse, we can tell its success by the extent to which those beliefs are taken to be the truth. A belief is not true. If you believe, I don't want to necessarily offend anyone who has a particular religious disposition, but I'm going to say it anyway. But just know if, if you are of a religious disposition, I am not singling you out to you. But beliefs and truth are not the same thing. I believe that in my lifetime, Swansea City are going to win the championship. <coughs> That's not fucking true, okay? I had a job interview once, right, for a million years ago. I was doing a presentation, I was teaching philosophy at the time, and um, they asked me to differentiate something called a priori and a posteriori truths. And a priori truths are basically things which, which are true and cannot be any other way. So the idea that the sun rises in the morning is an a priori truth. Or one plus one equals two. Although that's an axiomatic truth, it's actually a priori because it could never be any other way. You couldn't add it in any other way to make money of the sun. And I presented as a joke that like Swansea City will win the FA Cup this year. 
as an apron crusher and I didn't get a job on the basis that they didn't think I understood the basic rules of philosophy and I was like, I'll take the piss. Anyway, when beliefs are taken to be true, that is when a discourse has found success. Okay? People then will start to make sense of the world through that discourse. Is that how so many um, German people through the Holocaust like, accepted the fact that they had to be these atrocities? It's an interesting example <coughs> because where I think a lot of people involved in the Holocaust accepted that it had to be done because it had become a discursive truth in that society. There were also a lot of people who, in if you like German civilian society, then it's always a controversial thing, this, right? Who knew what was happening, but did not want to acknowledge what was happening because it was difficult and dangerous for them to do so. To acknowledge it was to say, I, I know what's going on here. I know there are no deportations to the East. But that could have led you into a big set of problems also. So I think you had two levels of discourse going on in German society, depending on whether you were part of the machinery of it or whether you were, if you like, a spectator to it. And there's been a raging controversy ever since about you know, to what extent did <coughs> German citizenship know about what was going on. And they did. You know, there's no question there, they did. But they weren't willing to acknowledge it because to even do that would have been really, really bad for them as individuals or as groups. So that's also the sign of a discourse in action. Definitely, that you know, you believe this rubbish propaganda pumped out because if you don't, you're done, right? So, I think there's two examples, really good example here of how the discourses there were used to make sense of the world. You know, if you were in Germany in the 1940s, those people weren't coming back and they weren't going anywhere else. But you had to make sense of the experience through the discourses you've been provided because. The alternative to doing that puts you in a great amount of personal danger. Um, this idea of accepting discourses as a way of seeing the world is historically something that makes good sense. You know? We construct a particular discourse and that is then how we explain what is going on. We have see it in action all the time. I've mentioned the Russian invasion of Ukraine already today. Can somebody tell me what the hell is going on in Ukraine at the moment? Pretend I don't know anything. Can somebody tell me what's happened? Uh, Russia's invaded Ukraine. Stop right there. Russia has invaded Ukraine. What's that? Uh, BBC News. BBC News has told you that Russia has invaded Ukraine. But, whoa, stop. Wow, that's a completely different discourse. Incorrect, but a completely different discourse altogether. Russia has made it. No, it's not in vain. No, 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 there's no dispute of fact here. Russia has invaded a sovereign country. Oh, no, it's not part of Ukraine, it's part of Russia. No, no, we can see that the America uh, invaded Iraq and invaded, invaded the, the, the Middle East and uh, that the Russia invaded the Ukraine because the Ukraine wants to join the NATO. I want to put a NATO. Okay, okay, stop. Stop. So, you put Ukraine wants to join NATO. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, so. So Russia has taken its armies and put them in Ukraine. No, no, no. Yes. No, 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 no. no, no. But, wait, but, but, that, but that's what happened. Yes. That's that's a fact. No, it's not. Russia, is, Russian armies are now in a country which is not Russia. Is that true? <laughs> no, because that's how what what World War Three happened. Never mind what Russia wants to do. Are Russian armies in a different country which isn't Russia? Yeah, but we. Are... Yeah. Oh. Yes, therefore they have invaded. No, it's not. It is 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 not. That is the view as given by who? 
Peter. Who said that? <coughs> Why would you hold that thing? So then he could continue <coughs> turning a blind eye to it until the Russian public don't turn against him for it. What do you, what has he called it? Do you know? There's a, there is a specific phrase, I wonder if you know. Taking that. back the motherland or something like that. That or no, that's interesting you've mentioned that because that's actually part of the discourse that underlies the phrase that has been deployed. The phrase that's been used, Russia will not call this an invasion or a war. They have used a very specific phrase which is called a special operation. All Russian news footage and news about the, let me use the word very clearly, invasion of Ukraine classifies this invasion as a special operation to liberate the Ukrainian people from the Nazi government that runs Ukraine. That is the discourse constructed by Russia. Now, in two senses here, we have discourses in action. One, you have the side that perhaps might be fair to say as a collective group in the West sit on. That there is a discourse of what has happened in the Ukraine. That for reasons mostly associated with territoriality and the idea of creating a buffer zone between the West and Russia itself, Russia has invaded Ukraine. It has committed countless number of war crimes in doing so. Many, many thousands of people have lost their lives, civilians and armed forces on both sides. People's lives have been ruined, it's created a huge refugee crisis in Europe where more than 5 million Ukrainians have had to flee their homeland in order to live in other places in Western Europe. That's the version of events that is given to us. A discourse. We accept that discourse as common sense, as being the truth. In Russia, a different discourse has emerged. Like I just said, that this is a liberation operation, a special operation to liberate the Ukrainian people from their oppressors, which happen to be their democratically elected government, who are Nazis, clearly, no they're not, in order to do what? To liberate them and do what? Any ideas? It's very simple. Make them Russian. But, um, the end game of this is not to have an independent Ukraine. Ukraine will be Russian again, just as it was largely between the period 1917 to 1991 when it was part of the Soviet Union. This is the discourses which are being employed. People on either side are accepting this as the truth. If you were to ask a Russian civilian to explain the events that have occurred since February 2022, they would, I would say in most cases, would give you that version of events. Because it is a discourse through which they have made sense of the events that are occurring in Ukraine. Just as there is a discourse that we have made sense now. Are either version true? <coughs> that is why we have to be careful. It would be my implication to say that the Russian version is completely false. Is the Western version completely true? Actually, there are some problematic aspects with the way we've explained this in the West as well. There is no doubt about that. But, which one do I trust more? I think I trust the Western version more, to be quite honest. Because it is not the construct of a state media that operates as a propaganda arm of the Russian government, for what? You know, that there is a little more objectivity, at least, in the version which has emerged in the West. But neither of them serve a different function to the other. These version of events have been created to explain what is happening to an audience in order to get them to agree with this version of events, that creates support for our military man uh, support for the Ukraine, for example. Britain, as a country, is pouring hundreds of millions of dollars 
because everything's in dollars. And given it to Ukraine in order to support their defence of Ukraine against Russia. At a time where people's bills are going up, people have less money, public services are finding it difficult to operate, that is a big call. So the discourse enables us to be able to do that. It, it gets people on side. You know, if people are like, I don't even know why this is happening in Ukraine. Why should we be given the money? The government being in a lot of trouble exploring this, but the discourse works to legitimise their actions. Similarly, on the Russian side, the discourse works in order to legitimise the actions of the Russian military at that point in time as well. Is everyone clear? Everybody operates through discourse. None of us are immune to discourse. My aim of teaching you this is to get you to recognise it. But you will not stop doing it. It is impossible. Totally impossible. I have discourses operating right now for the back. Everything is seen through discourse. One of the primary functions of doing degree like media is to get you to recognise that. That if, and I hope, I've been talking about most if not all of you here, go on to successful careers which are media related, you need to recognise two things. One, you're going to be responsible for the construction of discourses. That's going to be you. So you could be telling the big lie in the future. You better live with yourself. And two, not only will you be responsible for the construction of them, you will be responsible for the deconstruction of them as well. You will need to be able to recognise discourse when it is act in action, and you will be you need to recognise why it is being employed at that point in time. People who are successful in any media industry have the skills in order to identify these things. So, often when I mark that essay about like Hollywood genres and discourse, there is the implication that students don't think that the director knows what he's doing. Like a Hollywood film director knows what they're doing. You give them a hundred million quid to make a film, you better fucking know what you're doing. And when you see discourses embedded in a film, that director knows they're putting them there. They know what story they're telling, they know how they're constructing it. And often I'll get essays, of, yeah, so that the, you know, the, the text has discourses in it. Well, who put the fucking discourse in? Writers, screenwriters, directors, producers, didn't come from nowhere. They're not not grounded in human discussion. If a film is a discursive statement about something, well, somebody created that discursive statement. I.e., usually, at the top level, the guy who made the film has got his name on it, I made this. And often people will think, oh, this course is just something that is ephemeral and happens. And it's, it's human. It's created by human beings. It's used by human beings. It circulates among human beings. It doesn't happen by accident. So, this course is closely related to, but is not the same as power. Somebody tell me what the word power means. No, really. No. I know what you mean, but it's not really that. Anyone, anyone study like science A level? Probably not, right? Is it like um, the ability to influence a certain chain of events? Uh, that's, pretty, that's getting closer. Yeah, this, in the media context, I'll be quite happy with that. Uh, control. Control. Influence. Yes, but how? Influence. Influence. Impact. No. Having like social capital and economic capital and culture. Too specific. Okay, let's, let's break it down very simply. Like 99.9% in time you control, right? Power means the ability of one thing to exert an effect on another thing. That's it. Whenever you see the word power being used, that is what is being described. 
A power relationship is when one thing exerts an effect on another thing. That's it. Now that's the classical <coughs> scientific definition of what power is, but it also relates to all uses of power in any other field. When you are discussing power in media, you are looking at how one thing affects another thing. So, usually media power is branded in the discussion of how does one thing, i.e. a newspaper, affect another thing, the reader. Yeah? Or how does one thing, a film, affect this purpose? Or how does one thing, for example, Instagram, affect bang, young people who are on the platform? There's a power relationship we have described somewhere. Power is expressed in ideology. So the power relationships of society are always expressed ideologically. And ideology is always legitimized through the discourses we have. This is how power and discourse are linked to one another. The role of ideology is critical. We are not blunt enough to say, you know, the rich control the poor. <laughs> that won't be a message that anyone wants to hear, right? But we are willing to encode it in a particular set of ideologies, which will legitimize that power relationship. For example, people who go to private schools are more suited to roles at the top of society like in government, or with directorships of large industries. Those people who have that education, that they are better suited to running the country than people like me who went to the sort of school which didn't have a functioning toilet, because it used to get smashed up every week. That's an ideology right there. It's expressing a power relationship in society. And it becomes discursive when you know it's grounded in the idea that you know, yeah, Boris Johnson is a really good candidate for prime minister. You know, he had the right education. Eton, Oxford, Boris Johnson's a fucking moron. Boris Johnson, I wouldn't let him run a raffle at like a school fete. He's an absolute imbecile. But he was great for Prime Minister. Because he had the right education. All the right connections. Probably had sex with most of them as well. 